It's the Tyler's Place Podcast, a podcast by brothers for brothers, brought to you by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. Now, from the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., here's your host, Maynard Edwards, 32nd Degree. Welcome to the Tyler's Place Podcast. I am your host, Maynard Edwards. As always, podcast at scottishrite.org is the email address. Grab all those Scottish Rite apps. Just go to your app store, search Scottish Rite. You'll probably find one for your own valley, but you're also going to find the Scottish Rite app, which allows you to talk to brothers all over the country in both the northern and southern jurisdiction, members only now, and also the Scottish Rite journal app. So check those out. Plus, you can still find the Tyler's Place podcast app out there and listen to all of the episodes. Last month on the show, I talked to you about a couple of unusual lodges, one in Korea and then also a lodge in Tombstone, Arizona. And I got a lot of email about some other unique lodges out there. And the one that really caught my attention was the Invisible Lodge. Now, the Invisible Lodge is for Master Masons who are also magicians. And joining me now is the worshipful master of the Invisible Lodge, Brother J.R. Knight. And uh, so, J.R., tell us a, a little bit about, I, I guess, the be- start at the beginning with the Invisible Lodge. So we've been around since uh, 1953. Uh, it was started by Brother Brewerton H. Clark. He was a well-known stage illusionist. There was a bunch of brothers um, happened to be at a convention, a magic convention. And they started talking, and um, that was the um, first unofficial meeting of the Invisible Law. And then they got together after that and actually formed the the organization. It's now in several countries in most of our states. We're growing by leaps and bounds. So obviously we know how to tell whether or not someone is a legit Master Mason. In terms of being a magician, how do you qualify for being a member of the Invisible Lodge? So we take all levels of magicians, um, from professional, semi-professional, and amateur, also collectors. Uh, we opened it up to clowns, um, mainly because of the shrine, about 10 years ago. If I've done my research correctly, it seems like the Invisible Lodge isn't an actual uh, building or an actual lodge place itself, but rather you kind of have meetings all over. But your main meeting hall, if I'm not mistaken, seems to be the infamous Magic Castle in Los Angeles. Yeah, so the, the Magic Castle is a new thing. We just started last year. Uh, since since 53, we've been meeting at different magic conventions around the world. Normally, we set it up in advance with the convention to get a room and, and a time that, that, um, that we can get in, uh, get on the schedule for the convention. And that's been going on since, like I said, since 53. Um, and that's when we'll, uh, initiate new candidates or have, have some fun. They do, guys do magic tricks and different things get together. That's always been at midnight on one of the nights during the conventions. Last year, we started meeting, having an annual meeting at the, World famous Magic Castle. We had, I believe, we had six new members that that year. I think we're sitting at about eight new members. We've had more members join. But that's the people that are actually going to make it out to the Magic Castle. But we have guys coming all the way from Virginia, uh, Washington, Canada, around California, Oklahoma. Many famous magicians, illusionists, however you prefer, throughout history have been Master Masons. Harry Houdini, I know there's this honorary Grand Master of Magic title that gets handed down from one great magician to the next. And I think most of them have been Master Masons. Uh, what about uh, Lance Burton? He was, I think he's the current Grand Master of Magic. He's not a Master Mason. Until Lance Burton, they were all Master Masons. And Lee Grable... Who passed it to Lance Burton uh, was is, was a member of the Invisible Lodge. The previous um, magical masons were um, prior to the organization's forming. Although a lot of people have heard of Harry Blackstone Sr., quite famous. He was a member of the Invisible Lodge. Uh, John Calvert, Peter Ravine, Sid Radner, Carl Ballantyne. A lot of people know him from McHale's Navy. A lot of recognizable magicians in the uh, magic community are members of the uh, Invisible Lodge. 
The Invisible Lodge itself, in terms of, I guess, the organizational structure, I mean, you're not chartered by a Grand Lodge anywhere. So is this kind of more of a, of a club or, or a community organization? Exactly. It's more of a, it's more of a, almost like, like the Shrine Clown, that kind of a situation. Grandmaster of Tennessee, we're recognized in California and other um, jurisdictions, Ohio, uh, we have, we actually met in the Ohio Grand Lodge for a while, uh, the, the brothers that were out there in, in Ohio, um, in, uh, England, um, they meet, they meet on a regular basis, but not, not as a lodge per se, as a group, Washington state, there's a group up there that meets quite often at one of the lodges, um, but we don't. We, you ha, we don't make masons. You have to already be a, uh, a, a master mason. Um, recently, I've actually we've had some guys ask to join before they were master masons, um, and I just held their paperwork until they became master masons. And I've, I've I've actually been able to go and participate in their degrees and then give them their their um, membership packet at their third degree. So how did you find yourself as the master of the Invisible Lodge? There's actually two titles for this for this seat. Uh, you're the international president and um, the most upworthy master as opposed to worshipful master. So I joined right after, just before I became the master in Temecula back in 02. I went to a um, magic shop right, right, right near the magic castle to buy my top hat. And the manager of the store was a member of the Invisible Lodge. And he told me about the organization, and I got the paperwork and joined that day. That would be 2001, I believe. They made me a director soon after that. I've been active ever since. In 2014, they voted me as the president. We've had, I believe, nine presidents through history since 53. There's no actual term. I'm sure there are dozens of guys listening to this right now, all with the same question, because I have this one as well. How do you become a member of the Invisible Lodge? Do you have to know somebody and get an invitation? No, you can email me, magicalmason1111 at yahoo.com, and I will be happy to send anybody that's interested um, kind of an information packet and an application. Our dues... Our a lifetime membership is $60 for the U.S., people in the U.S., and $75 out of the United States, mainly because of the postage is being higher. And with that, you get a really cool membership certificate, a membership card, and a pin that nobody can tell what it is until you hold it at the right angle. And then it says the invisible across one side and lodge across the diagonal. That is so very cool. Guys, InvisibleLodge.org is the website. That's J.R. Knight. He's the upworthy master of the Invisible Lodge, a lodge for master masons and magicians. Masonic news and interviews from around the country and around the world. This is the Tyler's Place podcast. In the 32nd degree of the Scottish Rite, there are vows of service, five vows of service, in fact. And over the last couple of months, we've been talking about those vows of service with Brother Mark Oldno, 33rd degree from the Valley of Santa Fe. He is our educational correspondent here on the Tyler's Place podcast. And Mark, we're going to talk about the fourth vow, which is the vow to be a soldier of the people. You know, Maynard, I suspect that of any of the five vows uh, of service, this is the one that is the least under... And so let's start, as we always do, with a little bit of historical background, some philosophical background. In order to understand the role of the people in the development of political science, um, it's important to understand that it was historically uh, contrasted um, with with the, the, the collective, uh, with what the Greeks called the agora, or the marketplace, which was a, a, a metaphor for the blind masses, the ones that are, you know, just running into the marketplace and madly kind of grabbing whatever they can and whatever their heart desires, but not really thinking, not really, not really planning. It's uh, it's it's kind of an economy and a trade that just sort of happens, uh, but with no real plan. Alexander Hamilton um, came along and 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 raised. This question, you know, much much later than the Greeks, of course, but raised the question in the first Federalist paper in 1787, 
And he posed the question of whether societies of men are really capable or not of uh, establishing good government from reflection and choice or whether they're forever destined to depend for their political constitutions upon accident and force. And he, he actually said in that first paragraph of the first Federalist paper that this idea that somehow or another the decision of that important question, whether whether really good government could be established from planning, from choice, or whether we're really always going to be a marketplace, um, was something that was sort of uniquely held aside for historically for the people of the United States. I would just propose that that we, particularly here in the United States, have a really neat, important opportunity to look back in our own founding documents and our own words to get a handle on what perhaps the people really means. And here, of course, I would reference us back to the preamble to our own Constitution. Let's pause and just think about the first 15 words. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, now, this preamble was one of the very last pieces of the Constitution to be drafted. Uh, it was drafted by committee, but it was largely the work of a delegate from Pennsylvania, a guy named Governor Morris. Um, now, Morris, we don't have any evidence that he was a Freemason, but of course, many of the people on the committee, many of the people at the convention, the men were um, lifelong Masons. Um, so he was certainly influenced, uh, certainly aware of the imagery, of the wording, of the philosophy behind the fraternity. Um, so I want to hold that aside for just a moment. Um, now, again, let's listen to the words. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. So at the very first step, at the very first announcing, if you will, of who we are and how we are to govern ourselves, at least the proposal to do that, it specifically frames what follows as a legitimate act of sovereignty that's empowered by the citizenry. The very first sentence, the very first three words are we the people. Everything follows after that. Now, likewise, there's a, there's a point that I think is often overlooked historically these days, a couple, more than a couple of centuries later, is that what applies that the people and in, in what they're doing applies to this entity called the United States, a whole people, rather than a collection of states or sovereign sub-nations, as the Articles of Confederation of the time had us. So it, the, the act of the people was to form a union and to perfect that union through the Constitution. Um, it, it created a United States, a whole people, a republic, which comes from the Latin, the res publica, a public affair, something that's held in common. Again, not, not necessarily dwelling on, on all of the distinct details, but a people is a union, um, an intentional sharing of ideas and of principles, a sharing of outcomes, if you will, that, that we're all in this together. It's perhaps not too surprising our precious and gentle fraternity had such a big influence on the, the evolution and the development of the Constitution. Um, you can see it in the very notion of what they were trying to achieve. In many ways, you can almost substitute the idea of a people for a lodge and its members. So we're seeking to evolve, as Scottish Rite Masons, a union. Um, this idea that, that somehow or another we're, we're not in competition with each other, but that we're compromising, and not compromising by giving up, but compromising by sharing, by developing a common idea that we all participate in and we all have a, a deeper look in. at the fourth vow of service from the 32nd degree of the Scottish Rite. That's Brother Mark Oldno, 33rd degree from the Valley of Santa Fe, our educational correspondent here on the Tyler's Place podcast. This is the Tyler's Place. 
from Flag Day, which was just a couple of days ago, to the Independence Day celebrations that are just around the corner, the many parades, the many marching bands that we're all going to see and hear over the next several weeks, we're certainly going to run into the music of our brother, John Philip Sousa, American composer and conductor. You know his music, The Stars and Stripes Forever, Semper Fidelis, which is the official march of the Marine Corps, The Liberty Bell, which most people know is the theme from Monty Python's Flying Circus. Uh, the list uh, well, goes John on Phelps and on and on. Uh, he was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason. In fact, his portrait is hanging in here in the house of the temple, just outside the Thomas Place Studios. I thought this was a great time of year to learn a little bit more and, um, about our dear brother, John Philip concert, Sousa. And, you know, and joining me is director of the Sousa Archives, um, Scott Schwartz. Scott, we're familiar with your music. We know the songs. Loyal. We know the, the marches. Um, and by Tell that us I mean, about Sousa uh, as a man. You know, they, they were committed to being at the rehearsals and the performances prepared. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> basically supportive. He was not interested in bringing on musicians who were complainers. Um, he spent most of his career touring, touring extensively. Touring can be quite demanding, and uh, you know, everyone has to pick up their own weight um, and, you know, and basically, and work through um, you know, difficult um, shifts. You, you have to catch a train at a certain time. Everybody needs to be at the depot at that time. Um, so in many respects, um, a tolerant man. Um, the members of his band called him the governor. Uh, part to give kind of a sense that you know, he's the one in charge. Um, and so from that point of view, um, what I would expect is a, a, a conductor who um, recognized the skills of his musicians, would utilize them to their best benefit, and uh, was always polite. Um, so if a, a musician during a performance or rehearsal had a problem with a, um, a, a phrase, um, it was just understood that if they screwed up, you know, Sousa would not raise an issue. Um, he would just make a mental note of it. And um, the musician knew that um, they'd have to woodshed that part again. And if at the next evening or afternoon's concert, the performer who played the previous day made a mistake, and this time played it well, Sousa would just look at the player, put his hand on his heart, and just kind of tap it as a way to say thank you for woodshedding that 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 problem space. Um, so in many respects, you know, he wasn't into uh, make people's lives difficult. Everyone knew what they had to do, and as long as they did it and did it well, he had great respect for them. Sousa did not invent the sousaphone. Um, that would be Pepper, the um, music uh, manufacturer. And it was largely in response to the Helicon, which is a sousaphone-like bass instrument. Wraps up around your body, bow points forward. Settle an argument and from marching band in high school. Sousa's John Philip Sousa did or did not invent the sousaphone and lots of low brass. Now, we think of Sousa as a marching band, but it wasn't. It was a concert band, so most of the band's performances were in concert halls. Well, the normal tuba, the bell points upwards, so the bulk of the low brass sounds at the back of the band go up into the rafters of the theater, and supporting the, the rest of the band sound without overwhelming it. Uh, the helicon, because the bell pointed forward, produced too much low brass sound and made it very difficult for the, the band to find a balanced sound. So he basically just complained, can you do something about the wretched bell to the helicon? Of which Pepper did. Um, he created a, a helicon-like instrument with two 
bells that you could interchange. One bell you could put on your um, instrument, and the bell would point upwards as a traditional tula would. <clears throat> In a marching configuration, you could put on a different bell so the bell would point forward, which would have been and has almost always been used by marching bands in outdoor settings. Pepper just names his invention the sousaphone um, in honor of you know the March King. So that is essentially the 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 birth or rationale for that specific instrument. Um, Sousa did not design it. John Philip Sousa, as a Mason, he sounds like he was a pretty busy guy. So am I guessing that he didn't make it to too many Masonic meetings, but kind of like George Washington, he was a guy who really, Masonry was a part of his life, even though he didn't get to actually sit and lodge all that often. When opportunities availed where he could participate in a, a meeting, a session, a conference, um, you know, he he would try to do that. But as you said, he was a very busy man. Um, he was proud to be a Mason. Um, and many of the other great conductors of the time were also Masons. Um, so, you know, it was a, a way to connect these musicians together outside of their um, musical realms in some respects. For folks who want more information about Brother John Philip Sousa, give us the website. Our website is sousaarchives.org, all one word, no space between Sousa and archives, so sousaarchives.org. That'll take you directly to our front door, and um, you know, we have many different collections, Sousa being um, a, a significant one. Um, you just go up into the right corner and do a quick search on John Philip Sousa, and you'll see not only his collection, but many others that are associated with him and his music. That's Scott Schwartz. He is the director of the Sousa Archives, which, as he said, you can find at sousaarchives.org. He's a Masonic rock star, and this is his game. Tyler's Trivia with Grand Archivist Arturo de Hoyos. You've been world traveling again, globe trotting, as it were. I heard you were in Amsterdam. Is that correct? Amsterdam? I know you were in Africa as well. Where have you been? Uh, that That's true. Uh, I was briefly in Amsterdam, but that was to and from a visit to the Supreme Council of South Africa. I had a great time. And just to tell you something that interesting that came out of that, uh, the Grand Commander of South Africa, Supreme Council of South Africa, illustrious Boot Duplissis, or Duplissy. That is the best. That that should be like a bad guy name in a Bruce Willis film. Oh, it, it's an awesome name. It and he's, really a, he's an awesome guy. Let me tell you, all the brothers that I met in South Africa were fantastic. And I learned from the Grand Master of South Africa that they were actually the first integrated uh, organization following the end of apartheid, which is fascinating wow. to me. I mean, that speaks to the power of masonry, of course. Um, but what I was going to say is that the Grand Commander, uh, almost immediately after our Supreme Council session, or their Supreme Council session, of which I am now an honorary member, uh, traveled uh, to the Ivory Coast and they formed a confederation of Supreme Councils for the continent of Africa. And that means, of course, that they are still independent Supreme Councils, but that they will work for and on behalf of each other to protect each other's rights as Supreme Councils, to prevent the uh, invasion of their territory, things like that. So that's an exciting thing. Uh, the question, interestingly enough, and I don't think this was designed by you, it certainly wasn't designed by me, but our question appeared as a trivia question during Celebrating the Craft. So viewers who saw that actually got the answer to this, and is what is the relationship between the House of the Temple and the Mercury Dime? Yeah, that's actually a great coincidence that we had that. And we could answer that by saying it's the same relationship that exists between the House of the Temple and the Walking Liberty Dollar. And the answer, of course, is that they were uh, the sphinxes were designed and carved by Adolf Weinman, the same person who designed the Mercury Dime and the Walking Liberty. And we're, of course, talking about wisdom and power that uh, flank the front steps and, and stand sentry over the, uh, the big doors. Absolutely. Just fantastic sculptures. If you look at the sphinxes in detail, you can see that one of the sphinxes has its eyes half closed and the other is fully open. Uh, power 
is the sphinx that has its eyes fully open, and wisdom has the eyes half closed in contemplation. Also, the unique thing about those is those were not carved elsewhere and then brought in. They were brought in as solid blocks, and Adolf Feynman carved them on site. Yeah, we had some wonderful photographs, actually, uh, of the work being done here on the House of Temple on site, and one of them is you know, chisel in hand, mallet in hand, and working away. It's just unbelievable. I, that, I don't know that that type of skill still exists in the U.S. I, certainly not to the, to the level that that man – I mean it's, it's remarkable, the level of detail and just – I would always worry, you know, when I was in high school and I had to make a shelf in shop class, you know, you cut one side of it just then you got to cut the other side to even it. Next thing you know, you got a shelf that's about three inches wide. I, that's the kind of thing I would worry about in sculpting. That's why these guys are masters at their work so. and we're not. I guess so. <laughs> We had a lot of guys who got that. We're going to pick a winner from amongst those. So let's dive into a new question as we find ourselves here in June of 2018. Okay. Well, you know, we were speaking about brothers and other languages. Here's one for you. Um, in which other language did the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction officially print its ritual? In which other language did the Southern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite officially print its ritual? I might know this one. So, but if you think you know, send an answer to podcast at scottishrite.org. You can send me a direct message on either the Scottish Rite app or on SR Chirp. All are acceptable, and uh, we will select a winner from all of the correct answers. So you've got an equal shot no matter what. So, Art, I know you've got uh, travels to prepare for, so uh, safe travels, and thanks for hanging out with us. It's been a blast. See you guys on the flip side, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. This is the Tyler's Place. That is going to wrap it up for the June 2018 Tyler's Place podcast. I'm your host, Maynard Edwards. Thank you for joining me. And until next time, we'll see you right here on the Tyler's Place. If you're interested in becoming a Freemason or in joining the Scottish Rite, email us at podcast at scottishrite.org.